Good morning. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, please. We are in the book of Acts, working our way through the Bible verse by verse. Acts chapter 6 this morning. Verse 1, now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. I'll explain those in a minute. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, Timon, Parmethes, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied, excuse me, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people, miracles. And there arose from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cretans, Alexandrians, those from Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced, that's code for bribed men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. They also set up false witnesses and said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, and they saw his face as the face of an angel. Let's stop there and pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for capturing the story for us that we might study and grow and understand what you're doing in the early church and what you want to do today in the church. So have your way in this place. Teach us, change us, Lord, so that when we leave this place, we're different than the way we came in. We ask that in Jesus' name and all of God's children agreed by saying, amen. You may be seated, please. Wow. Somebody came up and went through my notes last night, I see. But that's good. That's okay. That means they were checking me out, making sure I wasn't lying, and they could check it. If you're here this morning, come and talk to me afterwards. We'll be happy to... Sorry, taking so long. (laughs) Wow. We're going to cover all this today? Oh, my goodness. What was he thinking? Okay, sorry. So this chapter teaches us about growing pains in the church. It's a very interesting section. Uh, It also includes the first martyr, uh, Stephen's trial. Growing pains are normal in most churches, and uh, we went through plenty of them when we started. The history of this church, in in just a thumbnail sketch, is we started with 22 people in uh, a, at the University of Redlands in a psychology classroom, and uh, too many people came the second Sunday, we had to move to a a lecture hall, and by the third Sunday, we had to move to Wallach's Theater, and a couple of Sundays after that, we had to move to the chapel, so the church grew very quickly. And uh, some of you, I'm looking around the room, 
We're act- I won't ask for a show of hands, but a, a number of you uh, are, are stuck in a rut. You're still here. <laughs> and that's a good thing. But along the way, there were always difficulties. We want the church to be like this. We want the church to be like that. And that's, in fact, what we're reading about here in Acts chapter 6. The first Christian church in the city of Jerusalem is going through growing pains. And they ran up against a a couple of issues. Now, I was studying for this, and I came across a, a fascinating story to me about a, a number of churches that grew out of church splits in a little town in Georgia called Centerville, Georgia. And it's famous. It actually has the world record for the most number of Presbyterian churches per capita in the world, about 7,000 people in the city, and uh, they have 42 Presbyterian churches. How did that happen? Well, uh, it started, uh, even the, I didn't memorize all this. In fact, it's kind of long. The short version is they, uh, in 1899, the Centerville Presbyterian Church started with 20 families. In 1918, uh, uh, 1911, 12 years later, they had a dispute among the 150 families um, but it was uh, a big issue. Uh, they wanted to, uh, they had a split between when the offering should be taken, before or after the sermon. L- literally, that was the reason. And so out of it came a second Presbyterian church, uh, the Center Field Reformed Presbyterian Church. And, and this goes on. Three years later, 1915, again, it was a, an argument over flowers. They thought cut flowers were too lavish for a church and they wanted to use plastic flowers and on and on it went. So by 1931, uh, there were already 20 Presbyterian churches. Uh, Between 1931 and 1978, uh, they got up to 40. Uh, and, and love this one. In 1976, the 11th Westminster Covenant Presbyterian Church of Centerville voted to remain in a more liberal national denomination, so 15 members broke off, and they started St. John's Presbyterian Church. One week later, they had a, tr- a split over the name. So since 1975, more splits have happened, with the most recent in 2008, And uh, they called this church the Second Street First Ninth Westminster Covenant Reformed Presbyterian Church. I'm not picking on the Presbyterians. They just have the record. I didn't want you to miss this. And then they had a split, of course. And uh, the split was over whether it was acceptable to read your emails in church. Now I planted that thought in your mind, and I'm not going to see your faces for the rest of this sermon. (laughs) But when they split, they called the new church the Presbyterian Totally Reformed Covenantal Westminster Sabbatical Regulatory Credo Communionist Amillennial Presuppositional Church of Centerville or PTRCWSRCCAPCC. Now, you can't make this stuff up. I want you to Google it later and check it out. Centerville, Georgia. Uh, It literally is holding the record. So, Uh, The consequences of that was that there's a lot of churches, but it's not a very good witness to everybody that's watching, right? So here in Acts chapter 6, there's a historical event um, that gives me great confidence that the Bible is reliable. Because if I was writing the Bible, which you can be thankful I, I didn't and am not, if I was doing it, I'd try and make it a little more like a sales brochure, you know, that would draw people But God isn't like that. He includes everything. The Holy Spirit recorded all the doctrinal fights, all the issues that went on, uh, all the way. And if I was doing it, I'd go all the way back to the Old Testament and clean it up. I mean, that whole thing with Abraham lying twice about his wife being his sister. And and there were just issues along the way. David and and Bathsheba and and those 
friends of Job that were giving him really bad counsel. And it, it goes all the way through the New Testament with Peter, who's the head of the church, is denying Christ three times. And if you're trying to sell something, you try and make it more attractive. But God wants us to have faith that when we look at things like what we're looking at this morning, that we'll go, those people were murmuring. They were, in fact, gossiping. And, and, and they're just like us. <laughs> and they're sinners saved by grace. And so churches are filled with people like that as we meet. I heard a story about some pastors who went to a, a, a pastor's conference and then they went out to lunch together and, and it was a time of camaraderie. You're supposed to get close to one another. They're all from the same denomination. And the and, uh, first guy said, you know, I, I feel like I need to tell you guys I have, I have a weakness. And they said, okay, well, what's your weakness? He said, I, I'm, I'm ashamed of it, but, but I am kind of uh, stuck on alcohol. Now, I never do it in the church. Nobody else knows this. This is private, just you guys, right? And uh, so I, I have to be really careful about that when I go somewhere. The second guy says, oh, yeah, you know what? That really, really touched me because I have a problem with gambling. And every time I go somewhere, I have to be careful that I've lost a lot of money gambling. Nobody knows about it. I'm really ashamed of it, but there it is. We're confessing our sins to one another. The third guy says, hey, you know, I have trouble paying my taxes. I I fudge my income taxes all the time. And and, and I have difficulty holding on to money. And so my my great fault is I, I keep cheating on my taxes. Fourth pastor is absolutely quiet all the way through this. And uh, everybody looks at him and he says, uh, you know, I, I, I've never been tempted by alcohol. Don't have any interest in it. Gambling is not something I would ever do. I, I'm always careful to pay my taxes. But I do have a terrible vice. I'm a gossip. So this section breaks up into three parts, people's problems, selection process of these men who would really change the whole trajectory of the church and the the results of that. That's where we're going. Let's jump in. Verse 1, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, we've seen that the church was added to in Acts chapter 2, and uh, and now uh, God does multiplication. And uh, there arose a, a, a murmuring, a gonkomo is the Greek word, which is, is meant to sound like you're murmuring, gonkomo, gonkomo, uh, the he- against the Hebrews and the Hellenists. Okay, so the Jews in Jerusalem were two separate backgrounds. One of them were traditional Hebrews who had been there, who spoke the Hebrew language, who studied the Bible in Hebrew, who spoke probably Aramaic also during that time, the first century, really locked into the feast days and the traditions even after they became Christians. Both groups are messianic. They both believe Jesus is the Messiah. The second group are called Hellenists here. They were from a Greek culture. They were born somewhere in the world, probably not Israel, that... uh, they had been taken captive, maybe in Babylon, or even some went to Rome. Uh, there were uh, a number of people there from all over the world, but they had learned to speak Greek, and they were fluent in Greek, and they read a Greek Bible, a translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And so these two groups were suddenly put together in one church. They had their own synagogue before when they were practicing Jews. Now they're believers in Jesus, and they're all sitting together in the same place. And it led to a difficulty. Now, there's this murmuring going on. And I need to kind of pause a minute and say, you know, murmuring is one of the few things the Bible says uh, that God hates. He, he doesn't like sin at all, of course, but in the book of Proverbs, in uh, verse 16, six things the Lord hates, 
and yet seven are an abomination to him. Uh, and there's a list of those six. And then the seventh is one who sows discord amongst the brethren. So you could call it gossiping. You could call it uh, murmuring against other people. But this is going on between these two groups. So the early church cared for widows especially, and that's really where the, the, the fulcrum, the tipping point of this argument goes on. They were feeding those women who had lost their husband either through divorce uh, or they didn't have children that were able to take care of them. Maybe they were too young yet. But the Old Testament speaks very strongly about the responsibility of believers for widows, for orphans, and for foreigners. And so in this case, they're doing something very much like the Jewish synagogues did. The synagogues every day had a, uh, a, a feeding. They would actually prepare meals for widows who didn't have any way, there, no social security, no programs uh, in the nation. So that's what the early church is doing. So I have to give you that background so this will make sense to you. Um, they were uh, coming to the synagogue, and then when they got saved, then they looked to the church to do the same thing. So the Christian church in Jerusalem is feeding widows, and there's two separate groups, these Greek, these Hellenists, and these traditional Jews, these Hebrewists, and they're having an argument. Verse 2, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples. I like the word disciples. Uh, it was in verse 1, and uh, it will appear uh, over and over again in the New Testament, I mean in the book of Acts, 28 times. It was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the four Gospels, 100, 200 times. But here it is uh, a learner. Literally, that's what the word disciple means. And that's why I hope you're here, that you're here to learn what is important to God, what the Holy Spirit has recorded for us. And it's why we go through the Bible verse by verse, the Word of God. And we'll see this emphasized over and over again. So they say it's not desirable that we, the 12 apostles, uh, Judas had committed suicide, he'd been replaced by Matthias, and it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God, studying the Old Testament is all they had at that time, and serve tables and take care of these widows that are coming in. They are not saying they're above that. They're saying they have to choose priorities. And this is about priorities in their lives and in your life and in mine. Their priority is they have to study God's word because they're teaching every day. Now, this church in the first century, think about it in a minute, it's got to be like the most well-taught church in the world. I mean, on Sunday morning, Peter taught. The Sunday evening service, it was maybe John. Uh, and then uh, on Wednesday night, uh, they'd have Thomas or another apostle, all these guys who had spent time with Jesus, and then at the end of the service, they do signs and wonders. Anybody sick, come forward, and they would get healed. Now, that's a church. That's the way it should be. Instead, we're stuck with 2,000 years later, people that study the word so that they can make it understandable to you. But that doesn't diminish the importance of you and I studying the word of God. Because it is the owner's manual for life. It should be a priority in every one of our lives. Yes, it's a priority in my life now. Most of you know I was a, a scientist for years, and then God said, come here. Let me tell you something. Biochemistry is a lot easier than studying the Bible. It really is. Scripture takes a long time time, at least for me, but I hear it from every other pastor, to study it, to make it, to break it down in simple terminology. To make this a simple lesson took hours and hours and hours of work. Now, I'm not whining about it. I'm not complaining, but I'm trying to give you the flavor of what these guys are saying. 
It's not desirable. Uh, it's not the thing that we should be focused on. What we need to focus on is, in fact, studying God's Word and prayer. Now, serving table here means something like handing out food, because evidently they had hot meals as well as meals on wheels out to people, and then probably distributed funds to widows who were in danger of losing their home or, or had financial needs. So there was a lot of that going on here. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, he's speaking to the church. Now, the church is huge, more than 5,000 people at this time. We read in chapter 2 and 3. Therefore, brethren, seek from among yourselves seven men. These are the first what many denominations call deacons. We don't actually have deacons here. The word means to serve, to minister to others. But these are seven good uh, men with good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So they had to be from the, the group, from the church. People already knew them. They had a good reputation. They were known for being honest men. And they were full of the Holy Spirit. Their life reflected the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. And they were full of wisdom. So the good reputation is the word martyro. It's where we get the word martyr. That they are well testified of, literally it means, to serve. It doesn't mean a person has to be perfect. It, it just means that they have to have a, a good character. They have to be desiring for God to change them into the person that's like him. That we would become like Jesus. That's, that's where we're going. So these men had all received the grace. It's not that they were perfect. Everything else that we talk about so far up into the book of Acts about God's grace is a requirement for every single person is still true. You and I are sinners saved by grace. None of us deserve heaven. We get in because Jesus died on a cross and took the punishment that I deserve, that you deserve, so that you can say, Lord, I receive that gift from you and I surrender to you and please forgive my sins. And he does. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. It's still true what was true to them. So these men had a good re uh, reputation, but it doesn't mean they were perfect. No, in fact, we'll see some of the messes they get into as we move along. So, good reputation, martuo, it's a, it's a grace-filled fellowship, um, and they're helping others. The third characteristic is they're full of the Holy Spirit. It must be evident in their lives that they choose to follow what God wants them to do, not what they want to do. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit, singular, the fruit of the Spirit is love. But then it breaks it down for us. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in you. Well, how do I get the Holy Spirit? When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit upon you, is something you must ask for. God, I want more. How much more, Jesus said, will be given to them of the Holy Spirit who ask? So these men had asked and they had received the gift of love as well as the outworking of it in those other seven gifts. Fourthly, they were full of wisdom. The Bible underscores the importance of wisdom over and over again. In fact, the entire book of Proverbs is about acquiring this thing called wisdom. Solomon wrote Proverbs to his sons so that they would learn the importance of seeing the consequences of decisions they were ma making down the road. It is not IQ. It, it is not how much information you can gather and store in your head. Wisdom is the application 
to see the consequences of decisions made today, what they will be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 60 years. It's the long view. It is a gift of God. We are to ask for it. It's listed as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these men had acquired wisdom. James said, if you lack wisdom, then ask of God, who gives it liberally to all who ask. So here's a pattern here of what these men were like. They, they wanted to serve. It was their desire. And, and God is going to give them the authority. Uh, we'll see in just a moment by the laying on of hands. For, verse 4. But we, apostles still talking, give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry, diakonia, of the word. The serve of, to serve the word. The, it's the same word that's used to describe the deacons serving food only serving a meal of God's word. Uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be giving you a meal of God's word, and you should leave full. <laughs> that's the intent anyway. So that's what they're going to do. Second Timothy 4.2, Paul said to Timothy, who was a pastor, he said, preach the word. It's that simple. That's why we do what we do here. I've watched young pastors start churches all over the world, world literally. I, I've spoken at many, many pastors' conferences, most of them young pastors just getting started. They almost always start out right teaching the Bible. But after a while, it turns out to be a lot more work than what they counted on. And they begin to say, well, I, I'm, a young pastor told me, I was speaking at a conference in Germany a couple of years ago, and he said, well, I, I don't study. I just pray myself up, wind myself up, and let go. You've heard guys like that. You, you know what he's saying. He just got emotionally charged up, and he gave a pep rally. Preach the word, Paul said to Timothy. Pray and give out, serve the word to others. So the temptation is to back it off. And uh, we continue to do what we started with here so many years ago. 1979, we bought that old packing house up there. It was full of yams and other stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and it started out really small, but we started out in Genesis, and we worked our way all the way through to Revelation. And then we went through it again and then again and here we are going through it still all these years later so that's what God intends for us to do here it is in the very earliest beginning of the churches the prayer and the ministry the, the serving of the word second section this selection process and verse 5 the saying pleased the whole multitude. That in itself is a major miracle. <laughs> Everybody agree? And they chose these men. Stephen. Now, first thing to notice is that those are all Greek names. Seven men all having Greek names. The point is, it was the Greek widows who felt like they were not getting served correctly. So there's a stroke of genius here. They chose to make the, pers the people responsible for serving the food and giving out money to those widows all Greeks. It, it's brilliant. Now, individually, they are interesting guys. The first one, Stephen, we'll learn a lot about next week. I would encourage you to read Acts chapter 7. In, in fact, I think it's the greatest summary of the Old Testament you can read anywhere. He stands up and he gives a defense at the trial that we're gonna look at the introduction of it just in a couple of minutes, but he gives this summary of everything all the way back from Abraham clear up to where he was. And uh, it's 56, 57 verses long, it's long, but it's the source for how if you don't understand, if you've never read, never studied the Old Testament, that's the right way to start. Get started there in Acts chapter 7. 
So um, he becomes the first martyr. Secondly, Philip, the second one, again, a Greek word, he'll come to us in the following chapter, in Acts chapter 8. Uh, he will be uh, the first deacon sent north up to Samaria, and he's very successful there. And so then he goes down to the road to Gaza, which has been in the news this week. In fact, that reminds me, would you join me in a prayer just for a moment for uh, all that's going on in Israel? Lord, we, we pause a moment and we lift up the fighting, the war that started in Israel uh, and, and those from Gaza that have infiltrated into Israel. We pray that you would protect, that you would uh, bring peace, that you would uh, silence all the work of the enemy there, that your hand of blessing would be on your people and you would protect. We ask that you would do that and more. We ask it in Jesus' name and all of God's children agreed by saying amen. Sorry, I meant to do that at the beginning. I forgot about it. So there we go. So Philip is going to go down and meet an Ethiopian on the road from Gaza and, uh, and lead him to the Lord. He turns out to be the treasure of the country of Ethiopia, which leads to Ethiopia, almost the entire nation being converted still to this day. And then he goes from there to Caesarea where he marries and he raises daughters who are called prophetesses for God. So we'll follow Philip as we work our way through the book of Acts. Uh, Procurus, according to the early church historians, was the amicus, was the secretary for the apostle John. So when John wrote his letters, this man was actually the one who was writing them out and John was just dictating to the, the gospel of John. Prochorus was actually the one that wrote it down. The, the book of Revelation, Prochorus was the one that wrote it all down. He was the nephew of Stephen, uh, the one we just talked about up at the front. And he would later be martyred as the bishop of Antioch, which is where the apostle Paul later, Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus is part of Antioch that Syrian border area. Uh, Nicanor, martyred in Cyprus in 76. Uh, Timon, martyred in Basra, Syria. Basra is still in the news. Um, Parmenas, martyred in Philippi in uh, 98. And Nicholas, a proselyte, a convert to Judaism from Paul's home city. So those are the seven whom... They sat before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Uh, a laying on of hands signifies authority being passed on to them, and they were empowered for service. And they prayed for them, and no doubt the prayers were special, long, and, and involved. And, and I, I, I would just encourage you for a quick minute I have a, a, a surgeon friend that I've known for years and years who's not a believer, but he respects the church. He thinks I'm a little crazy, but he knows I'm serious about it. And I used to work with him at the hospital years ago. But I, I was telling him again about the power of prayer, and I give him scientific studies because he doesn't believe the stories that people say. So uh, in, uh, well, actually, way back in 1988, there's a cardiac surgeon at the uh, University of California in San Francisco. His name is Byrd, B-Y-R-D. I'm telling you that so you can look it up. The study was quite famous. He took uh, a thousand of his patients, cardiac patients that came in with chest pain, co complaining of difficulty in breathing, left arm pain, all the symptoms of a heart attack. And he split it into two groups of 500 almost each. And one of the groups would be prayed for by a group of people that didn't know them, didn't know their names even. They only had initials, first initial. And uh, the praying group would be compared with a second group, 500 people with the same symptoms, and, uh, and, and then it would be recorded at the end of five years. And the study was published um, in the University of Southern Medicine, I'm, excuse me, the Journal of Southern Medicine, and it created a, a stir because the group that was being prayed for had 11%, which is very significant statistically, 11% better outcome 
than the group that didn't get prayer. Like, none of them had bypass surgery required. Um, none of them had to have a cardiac transplant, a you know, heart transplant. Um, all of them just fared better, got out of the hospital sooner, just all the parameters. And I, I was giving this to him, and, and, uh, and then that was followed up by another study. Um, in fact, 27 more studies, most of them done by atheists because they didn't believe the first one. But all 27 of them were just compared by the Templeton Foundation. Some of you know that group. 27 different studies and 22 of them showed that prayer statistically and significantly helped people heal and avoid complications. So what are you saying, Pastor? Well, they prayed and things changed. And we should be doing the same thing. I'm trying to encourage you to pray, to, to hold up family members, uh, and, and people who are sick that you hear about, but also for salvation, of course, which is the greatest healing of all. So anyway, that, that was kind of a little fast. Uh, the, New Journal of, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published this last study. Okay, last section. Uh, the Word of God spread because they were teaching the Word of God. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, priests, the priests who were Jewish, who were serving in the temple. Two weeks out of the year, uh, the sons of Levi would serve in the temple. Um, now you remember Zechariah was burning incense in front of the altar of incense when the angel appeared to him and told him, told him he was going to have a son. John, John the Baptist. He was a Levite and he was serving a priest in the temple. They, many of them, became obedient, got saved. Why? Because the day they were serving in the temple, this is my understanding of it. Scripture doesn't say this precisely. But on the day they were serving, when Jesus was being sacrificed on the other side of the wall, there was a great earthquake, you'll remember. And he said, it is finished. All your sins are taken care of. And the earthquake shook the entire mountain. It turned black as night. And then the curtain in front of the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom, eight stories tall. Now, gravity doesn't rip things this way. It would rip things this way. Those priests were exposed to the inside of the Holy of Holies that they'd never seen before. None of them were chief priests. And it impacted them. What just happened? Why did that thing tear like that? Who died? What's his name? And it began to work on them. And now weeks or months later, many of the priests became obedient to the faith. A great many, huge, former priests. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith. Pistis is a Greek word. It means belief. He was fully believing and power. Did great wonders. He did miracles in the name of Jesus. He prayed for people and they got healed. The same thing Jesus was doing. And signs, things that pointed people to God. That's what a sign does. It points you to something greater. And so somebody would get healed of leprosy uh, or you know, something that was totally incurable. Modern medicine was not modern in the first century. So uh, his faithfulness uh, led to people experiencing miracles. But that caused him to be up in front, verse 9. And there arose um, uh, some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, men who had been slaves before. Okay, so there's 390 synagogues in Jerusalem, according to Josephus, at this time. But one of them was just with men who had been held captive by the Romans. They were probably slaves in uh, Rome itself. Uh, they were called libertines. Uh, they had purchased their... Um, there was a Roman general, Pompey, in 63, who... Uh, 
uh, brought them all to Rome, and then Rome had too many slaves, so he set a bunch of them free. They went back to Jerusalem. These are men who were Cretans, North African. You remember Simon who carried the cross, Simon of Cyrene. Alexandrians from northern Africa, the city of Alexandra, and those from Sicilia, which is the southern part of what's modern-day Turkey, right up against the country of Syria, and Asia, which is really the rest of Turkey, all the way over to India. So they began to dispute with Stephen. So those are all areas that were Greek-speaking. So Stephen is speaking, preaching in Greek, and these guys are fighting with him. Verse 10, but they were not able to resist his wisdom. The wisdom of the Holy Spirit wasn't his. If you lack wisdom, you ask God, and he gives it to you. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit by which he spoke, they, were, they couldn't, uh, so they, they, because they couldn't best him, they resorted to treachery. Verse 11, they perceived, oh, excuse me, they secretly induced men, the Greek word uh, hupoleo means to bribe someone. So they bribed these men to be false witnesses. We have heard him speak blasphemous words and against Moses and against um, this place. So blasphemous words because Jesus said something about uh, if you tear this temple down, he was talking about his own body, they misunderstood. You tear this temple down uh, on the third day, I, I will rise again. It will rise again. So they evidently, maybe that's the way they got it tangled up, but they definitely have it all tangled up. And the law of Moses, 613 commandments, uh, have been replaced by two. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So they served the people, the elders, verse 12, the scribes, and they came upon him, and they seized him, they arrested him, brought him to the council of the Sanhedrin. We have talked about last two weeks, verse 13. They also set up false witnesses, these men these bri who bribed. This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have, verse 14, heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. In a sense, that was true because the law becomes obsolete, the writer of Hebrews says. But we're trying to finish it up. 15, and all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, and they saw his face as the face of an angel. That, that's interesting to me, because they, they're saying his face glowed. Angels glow, according to all the Old Testament pictures of them. And they're saying that he's disrespecting Moses, and something should have gone off in their mind, who else had a face that glowed? Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. But, of course, that was lost to them. Okay, so um, there's this distribution that's unfair. A little summary here. And um, an ethnic group is feeling slighted. The apostles continue to teach the word of God, underscore the importance of it. And, uh, and then they appoint seven men. The people appointed them, and uh, they begin to explode and change the world. And they will be sent out throughout the whole world. Priorities. That's the way I read this chapter. Let me close with a, uh, a little statement about, a little story about priorities. Uh, what do I focus on in my life? What do I keep? first. What is the main thing? Uh, we say keep the main thing the main thing. Well, the main thing is God, is Jesus in your life. But um, I, I have an unusual illustration. It's from the Old West, but it's interesting. So Deadwood, uh, Deadwood is a town in the Black Hills and uh, in South Dakota. That's what it looked like in the 18, or the early 19, 1901, 1902. Full on west. Now, some of you know the name Deadwood because that's where Wild Bill Hickok was shot in the Deadwood Bar, the saloon. Why are you telling this in church, Pastor? Hang in there. It'll make sense in a second. So, if you go there, don't miss, and I've been there, uh, don't miss the museum. And in the museum is a stone. Um, that's the stone. And you can almost read it in this slide, but it was crudely carved 
by a man with a knife who was getting ready to die. And so dying words are important. This is what he wrote. On the one side of the stone are the list of eight prospectors who were, seven who were with him. All eight of them are there. And when you flip it over, it says this. Our ponies all got by Indians. I have lost my gun and nothing to eat. Indians are hunting me. But we got all the gold we could carry. That's the sentence I want you to think about. The temporary things in life, gold, to me, is hilarious. That's asphalt in heaven. But this man was saying, I'm dying, but man, I'm dying a rich man. His priorities are about temporary things. So I ask you, what's the main thing in your life? Keep the main thing the main thing. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you understand exactly what I'm talking about because God invades us and he changes our focus in life and we find ourselves desiring to do the right thing. If you haven't experienced that, don't leave this morning until you do. Would you stand please and we'll pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have left for us clear passages about the importance of you in our lives, our priorities. And most of us in this room, have experienced your salvation. And we know that you change us. We surrender and then you change us from the inside. And Lord, we pray for anyone here this morning who has not surrendered to you and we pray that you would give them the grace, the favor to do so right now. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's somebody here this morning who you, maybe you had in the past surrendered to God and you've kind of gotten off the path. Or maybe you never have. Maybe you, this is your first time in church. Maybe you're visiting and you've never let God have his way in your life. This moment is for you. We wouldn't do anything to embarrass you. But if you'd like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with God, if you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? I won't embarrass you. I'll just acknowledge your hand. God bless you, two of you in the back. And you, sir, yes. And you, young lady, God bless you. You, sir, along the aisle, yes. Anyone over here God is speaking to, the very back? Two, three of you, God bless you. Anyone over, yes, God bless you, two of you, yes. Anyone over here? If I miss your, yes, sir, young man, smartest thing you ever did. If I miss your hand, don't worry, God didn't. Those of you that raised your hands, we're going to pray and we're asking you to join us. We're going to say it out loud. We're going to ask God to forgive our sins. And I'll just give you a few words and we'll all say it with you to make it easier. So everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Those of you that did that, we encourage you to go over to these double doors to your left. We don't want anything from you. We want to pray for you and give you a Bible. Uh, if you need prayer for anything else, go there to the rest. God bless you. Give somebody a hug before you go home. Pastor Rick tonight, 630.